I guess I just went to the wrong schools. There was a cartoon that used to be on. I, it probably was something like Saturday Night Live, but it became bigger than life. They used to go, Oh no, Mr. Bill's black! And for some reason they take this Play-Doh kind of looking guy and they would stick him in some kind of circumstance. Kind of like Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote, you know, where Wiley e. Coyote is always trying to catch the Roadrunner and about the time that he thinks he's got him, turns out to be bad for the Coyote. <laughs> well, Mr. Bill seemed to be always underneath something about to happen and then he'd get splattered by it or torn up. And you know, I think a lot of times Christians are that way, on the internet anyways. They're running around like Mr. Bill. They're always going, oh no, the sky is falling. Oh no, Chicken Little. Oh no, Mr. Bill. You know, like there's this new law that's going to be passed. Oh no, we've got to fight it. Really? Oh, there's this horrible looking picture on the new tube of, of uh, what was it? I'm trying to think in my day, you know, things that were so dumb that today, you know, they're not even paid attention to. But Procter and Gamble. Procter and Gamble has the man in the moon. We need to boycott that. <laughs> was so dumb. It was stupid. I mean, even today, it's still stupid. <laughs> but it was one of those, oh no, Mr. Bill, kind of movements. You know, and Christians today, you know, if you let them, they're going to lead you astray. I mean, they really are. They're going to get you involved in every single little, you know, noise in the night that comes along and you're going to get all excited about all the wrong things. And then when Jesus comes along, you're going to be burned out and blown out because you're too tired to get up and get right and get on with it and do what he told you to do, which really was to share the gospel. I mean, most of the times I found that when people were trying to warn me about something, the person they were warning me about or trying to tell me not to do something with was usually the person that was closest to coming to God. I mean... For me, it drives me nuts, you know, like I I know people tell me that like someone like Glenn Beck is being witnessed to and I go, praise the Lord, you know, and then I see him use all these Christian terminologies to, you know, convert him into some money-making way of presenting the news, you know, and all this junk. And I go, man, I said, I'm not sure hope he gets saved soon because he's driving me crazy. <laughs> but the difference is, is I pray for him and his salvation. I pray he gets saved. I don't go out and say... Oh no, Mr. Bill, Glenn Beck is a Mormon. Oh no. You know, so he's a Mormon, you know, he's he's not saved, that's all. You know, that means everything that he does and everything that he looks at and everything that he chooses to do will have a perspective that's not Christian about it. You know, and people tell me all the time, Oprah Winfrey, oh no, Oprah Winfrey, you know, like she's some kind of you know, high priestess of Satan herself, or himself, or whatever. And it's like, oh, please, you know, go away, get real. How big is your God? I mean, I pray for her salvation. I mean, let's be real. You're not called to go out and find things that aren't there, or try to find things and make up things, you know. The, the gospel was given to you to share with the world, and if that's too much for you, you know, and you've got to find something else, maybe you ought to start with the simple, like the gospel, and go from there, you know, and see if you really can share the gospel. Because most of the people that tell me, oh, well, your gift is sharing the gospel, but mine is, you know, warning people about the end. My gift is warning people about these other people. My gift is telling other people what to do. My gift is telling other people who love other people what to do. No, it's not. <laughs> Your first commandment from Jesus was to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go. <laughs> go, you know. And most people sit and then tell everyone what to do. So, you know, don't get caught up in the, 
oh no, Mr. Bill, routine, because that's a growing phase, you know. They might not get out of it. They may run around because they can do that. Like Chicken Little, that you know, you know the story. Chicken Little ran around telling everyone the sky is falling, the sky is falling. You know, and he kept getting hit by raindrops. You know, and <laughs> every time it rained, he was running around telling everybody the sky is falling. And you know, I hope you're not one of those kind of Christians that every time it rains, you know, you're running around telling the sky is falling because, you know, the end of the world is coming. Of course, I mean that's simple. You know, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out. But you don't have to be, every time some incident comes up, making it fit. Like, you know, there's this big thing about Psalm 58 or 85 or whatever. You know, and so every time that there's a burp, every time somebody has a hiccup in the Middle East, it's coming true now. What are we going to do? Uh, I don't know what you're going to do, but me, nothing. <laughs> I'm not going to react to you, and I'm not going to act worried about it, because, frankly... I don't care. I pray for this person the same way I pray for them, whether I knew it was going to happen or it didn't happen. In other words, like, every time you run into an oh no person, what really are they saying? Read carefully their words and look at the direction they're pointing. Because you see, there's a, there's a warning in Scripture about fear-mongering. Fear-mongering is selling fear to people. And the way you do that is you repeat a false story, or you think it's a true story, but it creates fear. So anything that creates fear, or doubt, or worry, or anxiety, or frustration, or anxiousness, you're fear-mongering. You're selling something to the masses, to the public. And so when you do it, you're sinning. You're whoring God, so to speak, in order to sell fear, and then what do you offer after that? I mean, most of the time that I see, I see fear-mongering going on on the internet, the people don't say right afterwards, well, here's what the story is now. Beneath the story they tell them, but we don't need to fear because we have God who is our salvation and our comfort, you know, and or they don't say, um, even though, you know, Psalm 58 is happening or whatever it may be that they're saying, whichever Psalm, you know, this is our assurance that we have in Jesus that he will be with us always into, to the end of the age. And that if you're a soldier there, that you have opportunity to ask Jesus into your life right now and you can do it. With Jesus. In other words, they don't ever tell the rest of the story. They just promote the fear part. They grab a headline and run with it. Oh no! Oh no! So you see, most of the time, when you see these hype paragraphs, these hype news stories, these hyperboles, it's because they're trying to stir up your emotional response and sell you fear. Fear mongering. Mongering means selling. They're they're hawkers. They're they're like sitting down at the the bazaar. You know, if you've ever seen like those old movies, you know, like in uh, you know Olivia de Havilland or somebody way back when. Sometimes when they did biblical movies, they would show you a more accurate picture of what it's like in foreign countries where they have stalls, kind of like you know a stall would be like going to the swap meet. Only that's what the market is. You know, in most foreign countries that are not industrialized. <laughs> so you would go to the market and that's what you'd see, stalls of all this food and all these other things. And mongering would be someone yelling, buy my fruit, I got the biggest fruit. Let me tell you how big this fruit is. This fruit is so big that if you eat it, it'll last a week. <laughs> mongering is this part. So when a person's giving you a news story, they're giving you a runaround. When they're giving you this hype, they're making you go, <gasps> they're trying to stir it up. <laughs> and I laugh. Even, even the scripture says that God would laugh at them. I mean, look that one up. It's really funny where, where the, time, the few times it says that God will laugh at them. And it's always about fear, you know, like as though we need fear. No, we don't. So, looking at these fear mongers who deny that that's what they're doing, they say their gift is you know, telling you about this, you know, and that never mind that they don't add 
what they're supposed to do in the proper way of doing it, which would be to give you hope for your future, to provide the answer to the statement that they're making or the hype that they're trying to make you feel. They don't give you the rest of God's answer for what they're trying to promote or what they're saying out there. Matter of fact, most of the time when I see people trying to tell you, warning you about somebody like Oprah Winfrey or Glenn Beck or anybody, whether it be Billy Graham, Rick Warren or any, they never give you an answer. They always tell you what not to do, but they don't tell you what to do. Hmm. Sounds like doo-doo. <laughs> you see, for me, I always have the answer. All I have to do is ask. That's all I've ever had to do. The sad part is, is I really do ask God. And then he gives me the answer. And then I come back and tell him. I say, look, here's what you said. Here's what it does. Here's the effect on people. Here's what I've done. Here's what I prayed about. Here's what God said. And here's what we should do. And I'm hated for it. Because when you talk to God, and God gives you an answer. People really have no response for that. Oh, sure, they think you're crazy. Okay. Crazy for God. Crazy for feeling so blue. Because I'm crazy for life. Crazy for life. But I'm crazy about you. In other words, who cares they call you crazy? They call you loony, you know, or whatever. Or you should be locked up. Sometimes they try to get sneaky spiritually. They say, oh, so are you saying that God, you know, you talk to God and God talks to you and that's more important than the Bible? And I always laugh at that. I think, what if God talks to you in the Bible and he talks to you out of the Bible and both of them agree? Well, then one of them's got to be wrong. <laughs> Why if they both agree? <laughs> Come on. Woo! So I just usually say my piece, walk away, you know, and tell people, look, this is fear-mongering, this is fake, this is false, this is meant to stir you up, this is meant to hype you beyond what it is, this is an oh no, Mr. Bill moment, you know, and don't get involved in it. Walk away. So you did look at it, and it sounded good. <gasps> Ooh, maybe I should check that out. Well, before you go checking it out and filling your brain full of insane ideas, why not ask God first, Lord, let me check that out. Maybe God will go, no. Why don't you read my word? I don't want to read your word, Lord. It's boring, you know. I mean, come on now. Let's get real, God. You know, I, I, I've heard all that before. I want to read this new, improved stuff, you know. <laughs> I don't think so. When you study to show yourself approved unto the world, being conformed to the world, and being made of the world into a worldly person, then you will choose to reformat the mind that you have into the mindset of that which you're reading, so that way you'll agree with it and participate in it. But if you choose to reword that, that phony scripture I just quoted back into the original, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove it is a perfect except the will of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, don't be conformed to this world. Have your mind renewed, refreshed, restructured, and remade into the mind of Christ that you might know who he is, what he is, and what he's done. So whenever you have an oh no moment, go, Oh, no, I don't think so. Wait for God's justice. Knowing with all certainty that it is from the Lord and not from man that you will receive the inheritance, which is your real reward. The one whom you are actually serving is the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Colossians 3, 24. God has brought a great reward in my life in recompense for the abuse I suffered in my early years. Now I have a wonderful life. God blesses me. He does things for me. He opens doors of opportunity for me. He makes me happy. He gives me joy. When you really trust God, he will bring justice into your life. 
In Isaiah 61, 7, the Lord says, For your former shame, I will give you a double reward. Paraphrased. If someone has mistreated you, rejected you, abused you, or abandoned you, hold on to that promise. You have many blessings ahead of you. Trust God with your future and enjoy your day as you wait for God's justice. In waiting on God's justice, you know, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. And because his loving kindness fails not, they are renewed every morning. Always in knowing that God is going to recompense and give reward to those who have abused you, at the same time, pray for forgiveness for them so that their abuse isn't abused continually by you in expecting some kind of, you know, retribution. Because it's not retribution God gives, it's reward. Because if they sow these seeds that might produce a crop that they don't want to eat, you know, might be a little, that fruit might spoil in their mouth and might come like, you know, poison in their lips, you know, then... Let them deal with it with God on their way, but pray that God have mercy upon them, you know, and that in their time of reaping what they've sown, you might be there to restore them unto righteousness at some point in time, because that really is who Jesus is all about. In revelation of you becoming more like him in showing the salvation that they could have, even though they may have done wrong to you, you can turn that wrong into right. By after they have received their due justice from the Lord, and he will repay. God says it. Just, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And he does, even to you and I. When we do something to someone else, we get the consequence. Maybe not as tough as it should be, but, you know, God forgives us, but he still gives us the consequence. But, likewise, God will take care of anything when it comes to any of these oh boy moments that you might feel like oh no Mr. Bill that you gotta do something about it when really all you gotta do is give it over to God and let it go and wait on him.